So welcome to the lecture on chemistry of organic molecules. Now, again, I, I don't want you guys to get worried about this is a lot of chemistry or we're going in real great detail on it. This is biology class. We're going to look at living things. Biology is a study of life. But in order to study life, you know, we have to touch base a little bit on the chemistry. The main thing I want you to think about with this chapter, chemistry of organic molecules, is food. We're going to talk about the major biomolecules, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. That's the goal, is to look at this chapter and this topic in regards to food and things we eat. Because when we get into the metabolism unit, where we talk about our metabolic rate and energy, and we talk about weight gain and weight loss and things like that, this chapter is going to be connected. So if you don't know how to eat healthy, it's hard to stay healthy. And if we don't understand the basics of food or organic molecules, then it's more challenging to be healthy. So don't get too worried. We're not going in real great detail here, keeping it kind of broad picture, general ideas, and application based with chemistry of organic molecules. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is define what is meant by an organic molecule. Now, when you go to a grocery store, they have that section that says organic, organic celery, organic apples, organic, etc. That is a different perspective or different spin on what is meant to be organic. In the true biological and chemical definition of organic, Organic refers to molecules that have carbon and hydrogen within them. Okay, that's it. That's what makes you organic. Do you have carbon? Do you have hydrogen? So jump back to the previous lecture. Think about carbon. Carbon has an atomic mass of 12. An atomic number is 6. This right here tells us 6 protons. For every proton, you have an electron. Electrons go in the orbital rings. So you got six electrons. Think about the octet rule. Two electrons in the first ring, four in the second ring. Now, all the elements want to complete their outer rings, so that means carbon is looking for four more electrons. Okay, so this is an important thing when we talk about organic. Carbon needs four more electrons to be complete. So it's going to try to bond, whether it's covalent, it could be a single covalent, a double covalent, whatever. It's going to try to bond to elements in order to obtain those four electrons. Now that bonding and attaching of elements to elements to elements is what creates an organic molecule. All right, so sometimes when we look at organic molecules, they come in a form or a shape we call an isomer. Now, an isomer is a compound. Isomers are going to be two molecules that have the same elements but are arranged differently. Okay? <clears throat> so because they're arranged differently, it creates different things. It's basic ingredients, but it creates different substances. So let's take a look at glyceraldehyde here. Glyceraldehyde has one, two, three carbons, has one, two, three oxygens, and then there's six hydrogens. So you got three carbons, three oxygens, and six hydrogens forming glyceraldehyde when they're put together in this combination. And the key thing is this double bonded carbon to oxygen right there. That's the key structure that forms glyceraldehyde when you stack these things together. <clears throat> now, if we shift the position of that double bonded carbon oxygen and we put it in the middle here, so now it's in the middle, 
it now becomes this thing called dihydroxyacetone. Completely different substance. Same ingredients, you just change the positioning or the arrangements of how these elements are put together. This was meant by an isomer. Both of these are organic molecules. Both of them are using the same ingredients. They're just arranged in different patterns and combinations. All right, so <clears throat> what we'll talk about with this chapter is the idea of food, how we eat an organic molecule or organic substance, and our body breaks it down <clears throat> and then reassembles it into a different shape, different form. It's, maybe it takes glyceraldehyde and turns into dihydroxyacetone, or it takes a certain protein and breaks it down and turns it into a different <clears throat> shaped protein. Our body is constantly doing this. We're recycling and reusing the things we bring in, and if we don't need it, we get rid of it. So in order to break things down and rebuild them, the system goes through condensation and hydrolysis. Now condensation is a combination of small molecules So it's a combination of small molecules to form a larger one. So you take all these little pieces, stack them together, add them up, push them together, bond them, and you create a larger one. So we're doing this every time we grow. We heal, we repair ourselves, we develop. We're taking all these little molecules, pushing them together, condensing them into a larger substance. Hydrolysis is the exact opposite. Hydrolysis is the breakdown of large molecules or a large molecule into smaller ones. So what we're going to do with hydrolysis, <clears throat> think about digestion, decomposition, breaking down. That's what's happening during hydrolysis. So you have that big, <coughs> excuse me, big apple that you had for lunch or a big piece of hamburger or pizza or whatever it is and you're digesting it you're breaking it down you're chewing it up smashing it breaking it down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces during the hydrolysis process so what we're going to see these two processes condensation and hydrolysis are constantly working together so food comes in we break it down we take the broken down parts and then we build larger things. The larger substances eventually get broken down again and then get used and broken down. And it's just a continuous looping process here. Now, a lot of times it also brings in other organisms, other individuals. You know, we eat plant material. Eventually when things die and decompose, the nutrients go back to the plants, etc. But condensation, hydrolysis, pathways or processes are going to be connected together. Okay, So again, think about this with food. It's the easiest approach. I had breakfast. After breakfast, first thing that happens is I'm digesting it. I'm going through hydrolysis. Once it's all broken down and digested, then my body can take it and it will take those nutrients and then it'll go into condensation. I'll say, oh, okay, now I need to grow a new hair cell, I need to make a new skin cell, I need to repair muscle tissue that was injured at basketball practice or whatever activities you're doing, you're going to go through condensation. And then you need to get more food and bring more in to digest it and then build things and so on and so on. So when we're looking at this from a nutritional standpoint, we want to think about what are we eating and what should we be eating? So the USDA gives us some guidelines. It says roughly our daily caloric intake, how many calories we bring in in a given day, should be made up of these groups. Now, I'm going to put approximately. Approximately. 2,500 <clears throat> 2, calories 
are what the USDA recommends we eat in a day. 2,500. We're all different. Some people can eat more, some need to eat less. It just depends upon you as an individual. But 2,500 calories, <clears throat> you look at the back of a food package, and it'll give you on the label, you know, based on a 2,500 or 2,200 calorie diet. They're suggesting roughly 55% of our calories come from carbohydrates, so a little bit over half. 30% come from fats, 15% come from proteins. The one group they never, ever mention are the nucleic acids. Those are essential. You have to have those to build, to grow, and to make new genetic material. Now, fortunately, we don't have to consciously think about, did I get my nucleic acids today? That is the DNA. <clears throat> Every living thing you eat has DNA inside of it. When you eat it, you're getting the DNA from those organisms. Okay? But what I want you to think about with these percentages, this is a recommendation. I want you guys to figure out what works for you. Don't try to eliminate one group. Those diets where they say get rid of carbs and just eat fats and proteins, that's not healthy. You need a balance. You need all three groups because each group has a different function. Each group has a different structural makeup. And there's examples that we'll talk about throughout this lecture of each of these groups. So our fifth learning outcome for the course is right here in front of us. Identify the structure and functions of the major group of biomolecules. That's what carbohyd <clears throat> carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids are. Those are your biomolecules. And then give examples. That's what we're going to talk about. So if we're at the grocery store and give you that cart and I say, hey, go get me carbohydrates. What can you get? Go get me some fats. Go get me proteins. Fill your cart up with those particular food groups. Then when you go to sit down for dinner, when you're eating dinner, put half of your food as a carbohydrate, 30% as a fat, 15% as a protein. Build your plate in the same ratio, if that ratio is ideal for you. And that way when you're eating, you're eating a balanced diet that gives you all the biomolecules in the appropriate ratios. And keep in mind, this is going to change. What works for you today, in five years it may need to change, in ten years. Or anybody listening and reading the lectures who's an athlete, or if you're working out and exercising, you need to adjust these things based upon your activity level. And those are the topics we'll get into more when we get into energy and we talk about metabolic rate and nutrition and things like that. This unit's all about establishing what are the basic biomolecules, what are the functions of each of these groups. That's the key thing I want you to remember. What does each group do? And then give me some examples. Okay, so again, let's go to the grocery store and put carbohydrates into our cart. Let's put some fats, let's put some proteins. Which fats are the better fats? Which proteins are the better proteins? And so on. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing with this unit as we start working our way through the chemistry of organic molecules, or I call it the food chapter. Okay, so let's take a look at our first group, carbohydrates. The number one purpose and function of a carbohydrate These guys are going to supply energy for living organisms, for us, ATP. One gram of carbohydrates <coughs> gives you approximately, um, okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so one gram of carbohydrates gives us approximately four calories of energy. That is why we eat carbohydrates. We want energy. We want it in the form of ATP so that way we can power our system and have the necessary energy form to function. Now, when we eat carbohydrates, we can get them in different forms. Monosaccharides are the simplest form. These are single sugars. So what we'll do is we'll talk about the different carbohydrates in our next lecture here.